nutrition is going to be the organizing principle for the food system. And prior to this, for the last, you know, sort of hundred years as the kind of the legacy system was being developed, it was all about calories and securing calories. I think now it really is securing, you know, sort of nutrition. Now that has profound, you know, implications on how you, um, you know, how you transition to that, you know, kind of system. You have to start thinking about things much differently. Okay. Victor E. Friedberg is my guest on this episode of Inside Ideas, brought to you by 1.5 Media and Innovators Magazine. Victor has been at the forefront of innovation, investment, and sustainability for over 20 years. As co-founder of S2G Ventures, he was a principal force in developing the S2G mission, culture, strategy, and team. Through his work at S2G, he pioneered systems investing as a strategy for investing into food and agriculture and applied this approach in building the S2G portfolio. As managing director, Victor led the S2G investments into three food unicorns, Beyond Meat, Sweet Greens, and Appeal Science, all well-known as well as Maple Hill Creamery, Adaraxis, and Lava, among others, yep. um, which is a yogurt company, right? Yogurt? A uh, non-dairy, yeah. Non-dairy type of yo yogurt. Although now we're becoming a, a superfood company, and we'll talk about that a little bit. Superfood, super. Beyond Meat, which Victor served as board observer from 2014 to 2017, became the most successful IPO in 2019 and one of the most successful food IPOs in the last decades. His new fund, New Epoch Capital, invests in best-of-class entrepreneurs building transformative companies, defining a new era of health and wellness to support their visions of providing healthy, sustainable, effective, <laughs> Uh, affect us personalized and traceable products and services for the values conscious consumer. He is founder and chairman of Food Shock Global, a 501c3 blended capital investment platform of equity, debt, and grants with 25 of the leading funds, banks, foundations, universities, corporations, and nonprofits seeking to join him on his mission to transform the food system into one that is more healthy, sustainable, and equitable for all. Food Shot's Global Groundbreaker Prize is presently the largest prize for food and agriculture in the world. He serves presently as executive chairman of the fast-growing plant-based dairy company, Lava, and chairman of the organic toddler food company, Tiny Organics. He serves on the board of those two companies, as well as the biotech company, Caberti Air Protein. He is an advisor to the biotech company, Mori, and the SLM Partner Land Fund. He was named by Forbes Magazine, one of the top 25 deal makers and influencers in consumer products in 2016. And I could go on and on. He has been involved in this, as was said, well over 20 years is a veteran and a, a wonderful person, a good friend. We might see his dog in the background or a beautiful Ridgeback, hear him shaking his collar once in a while. Victor, welcome to the show. I'm so glad to see you. So good to talk to you. Mark, so glad to be uh, joining you. I know it's been a, a long time coming, but I, I'm excited to both catch up uh, as colleagues and also talk about uh, all of the great things that you've been following uh, on your uh, on your podcast over the last uh, year. So uh, I'm excited. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for being on. And I, I'm, I'm really honored and glad we could get it worked out. The last time, just for our listeners, the last time we saw each other was at Sustainable Brands Madrid in Madrid, Spain. Uh, we had a nice beer. As a matter of fact, it was my birthday. We had a little beer celebration. and, and uh, We did. And, 
in a bar afterwards, um, but you gave a beautiful talk and, and our paths have crossed at the Eat Farm and Eat Foundation as well in Stockholm, Sweden and many other places I'm sure over the years. You are just a pillar, a rock and a man after my own heart and, and the vision that you have for food, not only in, in, um, in your investments, but in just the transformer transformative global moonshots, this global food reform vision you have for the entire industry and where food no needs to go. And so I wanna just right out of the bat, out of the shoot, first, with all this years of experience with these investments and real strong focus around health, sustainability and equitable future for food, has any of that helped you weather this pandemic and how the hell have you been in this tumultuous, crazy time? Well, um, you know, you mentioned, uh, you know, our meeting in Madrid and sort of Stockholm, that definitely seems like a, a long time ago. And now we're all meeting on Zoom calls like this and having, you know, uh, conversations, uh, you know, uh, virtually with lots of folks. Uh, so, you know, like everybody else, you know, I've adapted to, you know, sort of that reality, but I do look forward to, uh, you know, getting back into the world and uh, engaging, uh, you know, personally and traveling and the like. I mean, like everybody else, you know, the last, you know, eight or nine months um, have been deeply profound, you know, uh, in terms of, your family life, you know, your personal, you know, uh, you know, life, certainly um, the trials and tribute you know, tribulations, as well as opportunities on, you know, uh, on the business side. Um, but I don't think anybody, uh, you know, um, isn't looking forward to uh, what's coming next and hopefully uh, a better 2021. And, uh, you know, it looks like uh, we're on a good road to do, you know, to do that. What I will say is that, you know, uh, over the last, you know, seven or eight months, you know, one of the things that I had done right before COVID was to dedicate myself to taking uh, operational roles um, in either portfolio companies or companies that, you know, uh, I had, um, you know, uh, interest in, um, in either the founders or in, you know, what the company was doing. And I have to say, you know, being, going from the investor side to the table to the operational side of the table is a, incredibly educational experience and any investor, you know, I would recommend, you know, a tour of duty, you know, out of the, you know, investment committee room and into a company um, if they haven't priorly been, you know, operators, because you're going to look at investments completely different, you know, leave from that, uh, you know, sort of vantage point. That was true before COVID. During COVID, you know, you really become to realize how, you know, um, you know, companies are ultimately dependent on teams and the team's ability to step up, ra rally, you know, uh, you know, pivot, you know, analyze, feel, like, you know, all of those skills come to bear, you know, in a timeline that is very intense and very um, consequential. And so, uh, you know, hopefully you're stronger for that at the end of it. Um, but it's, um, you know, it's, it's been a profound time. Um, there are things I've learned from that and clearly, um, you know, I you know, would love to talk a little bit about, you know, these sort of big macro changes, you know, that, you know, have happened, um, you know, over COVID and one could argue that they weren't changes at all, you know, they were um, foundational, you know, cracks that had been there 
and the stress of COVID just made them, you know, uh, more revealed and more urgent, you know, to uh, address. And I think that's the main thing that I've seen is that all of us who have been deeply involved uh, in food system change and understanding the implications for human health and for uh, um, for sustainability and planetary health and for, um, you know, sort of equity. Man, like uh, COVID brought all of those to the surfaces, you know, in ways that ultimately would be, I think, very positive and beneficial, you know, for uh, the industry and for the world. Um, you know, but what a uh, profoundly, you um, uh, I don't know, just, uh, you know, hard way to learn those lessons. Yeah, yeah, the really hard way. I mean, like not only did it, a lot of things bubble to the surface, uh, but we got a microscope look at what was wrong and what, 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 what was right and, and uh, just got this different perspective, but in a very hard way. I mean, uh, the food industry and gastronomy was really one of the hardest hit but it was also amazing. And I think, uh, and I kind of want to follow up with, with you sharing this is that a lot of those companies that you, you invest in that you're kind of operations and focus on, they already have this ESG model or business model or way of thinking they're focused in on health and sustainability and the future of food, but also this global re food reform, how we can do food differently. Um, they were a lot of them as, as far as investments go first, second and third quarter outperformed conventional uh, um, counterparts, sustainable index funds, ESGs, food companies received investments, a lot of a lot of positive movement for really a recession, a pandemic, a huge thing first, second and third quarter, which which was amazing. But um, it also said, OK, well, here's the ones that that haven't been walking the walk or, or just been talking about it, haven't made that transition and they're really suffering. So, but it's also put them, those who, who, who did make that transition in a better position to deliver vital services, essential services, continue producing. Um, but it, for example, the meat industry, I mean, boy, the, their setup and practices were just not very sustainable. What, also ones where there was a lot of problems, especially here in Germany with the meat industry and, and in yep. the US. And so um, were, were there times where those companies that you're involved with says, hey, uh, we didn't listen, we need your help or, or, or so just aha moments in this time that you can maybe elaborate even more on where you saw that coming out and emerging that, that it maybe confirmed to you, this is a better model or Oh no! There's uh, this microscope is showing us we really need to work on these. Yeah, I mean, I think from you know the vantage point of you know companies that I've either invested in or um, you know been operational in, or from you know the overall vision you know of let's say you know what i've put forward you know for sug and for you know food Shot global all of those held up you know you know sort of you know sort of quite well i mean those theses didn't um you know didn't anticipate a black swan event you know like um you know sort of you know sort of covid you know there were touches of them like um, you know, a company I had uh, led the investment in, Ataraxis, which is, uh, you know, it's a, um, it's a technology that basically uh, allows supply chain managers and stakeholders uh, in the meat industry um, to validate that the meat actually is antibiotic free, right? So it's a, you know, kind of a honesty system um, but also for, uh, you know, um, you know, meat companies who want to make sure that, you know, their supply chains are meeting their spec and trying to figure out where the weak points, you know, are and that you need a, you know, you need a low cost, reliable, you know, sort of test says the, you know, the, the meat that you're buying isn't, you know, sort of antibiotic free. Now that investment got done, you know, years ago, but you know, now you look at it through a COVID 
you know, sort of frame and sort of, you know, understand, you know, the relationship between, you know, uh, you know, you know, livestock farming and, you know, sort of, you know, the meat industry and, you know, um, bacterial superbugs and, you know, even potentially sort of, you know, sort of viral ones, you start understanding that, you know, that system, you know, is, you know, potentially ripe for the pandemic we can't see going, you know, forward. Exactly. So, yeah. you know, how do you start, you know, thinking about, you know, an industry like that and a technology like that you know, not just in terms of, you know, consumer traceability and, you know, transparency, but now on this bigger theme of how do we keep, you know, our food systems moving, you know, towards a, uh, you know, a, a security that prevents the next, you know, sort of, you know, sort of pandemic. So it's, it's interesting to go back and, you know, look at an investment, you know, um, you know, like that, you, know, you look at, you know, certainly the Beyond Meat investment, you know, you know, the IPO happened clearly before, you know, COVID. And I think the view of, you know, Beyond Meat prior to COVID was that, you know, this sort of plant-based, you know, meat revolution, you know, was super aligned to, you know, the new consumer and, you know, people moving um, into flexitarian diets. And, and that was all part of, you know, sort of the, you know, the IPO. Once COVID hit, now you look at those companies much differently. And I think, uh, you know, all of the investment banks have, you know, reassessed the total addressable market for plant-based meat, you know, coming out of COVID, you know, and it gets to a trillion dollars a hell of a lot faster yeah. than people thought, you know, um, we were you know, saying six months unbelievable ago. things in that area, just uh, plant-based milks, plant-based meats, uh, everything. Yeah. It's just unbelievable growth during this time for probably the biggest sector period. I mean, just uh, oat milk just went through the, through the roof, you know, and it's, it's unbelievable how that was. Was that first company you mentioned, was that a, a blockchain or emerging technology type, or was it just a digital digitization? No, no, it's a, it's a lateral flow, you know, sort of, you know, um, you know, sort of pregnancy test meets, you know, sort of biopsy, Wow, wow. you know, um, um, but, you know, then into databases and readers and, you know, um, you know, supply chain visualization and, you know, all of, you know, you know, all of those beautiful, kind of things. Um, so, you know, uh, it's just an example that, you know, you can now look at all of these, you know, sort of companies as, you know, they had, you know, they had tailwinds going into COVID um you know and now they have sort of like gale force winds you know you know sort of you know sort of during you know covid you know i i think you know for me the frame you know that everybody's still trying to get their arms around and you know anybody who says that they have a you know a crystal ball clear vision as to you know where this all you know sort of ends up you know i don't think uh you know uh you, you can you can get there, but um, you know clearly, you know automation, you know um, decentralized distribution, um, you know traceability, blockchain, like all of that infrastructure part of the food system that was the unsexy part that very little investment you know, was going into certainly, you know, home delivery and last mile stuff and, you know, online groceries. I mean, there's plenty of, you know, capital going in, you know, to that, but, you know, into, you know, you know, processing, you know, into storage, you know, into logistics, you know, all of the things that came under incredible pressure uh, and buckled, um, you know, meaningfully during, you know, sort of COVID. I think those are starting to emerge as places where, you know, capital is going to, you know, start finding its way to, 
um, because I think we have to reimagine that middle layer, you know, of the food system. And, you know, most of that hasn't changed for 70 years, you know, and, uh, um, uh, you know, it, it, I think that's an interesting sort of development. Um, the other place I'm very interested in and, you know, with investments like lava and, you know, sort of, uh, tiny organics and, but also, um, air protein, you know, uh, another one. Food as, you know, affordable nutrition, you know, uh, and even food moving towards, you know, um, medicine, I think is the big winner as a trend coming out of, uh, you know, COVID. Um, clearly the two most important words, you know, I think from, uh, you know, to really understand COVID's relationship to the, you know, to the food system are the words underlying conditions. I mean, you know, um, you know, that underlying conditions is now also turning into, you know, when you're talking about healthcare pre-existing conditions, you know, but, you know, the 70 years, you know, of cheap calories and, you know, you know, sort of food as marketing, you know, I think that era is truly coming you know, to the end, because it has to, I think, you know, investors and venture capital was pushing that forward because one capital wants to find new consumers and new markets to, you know, to create, but now at a macro level, global stakeholders are seeing the, you know, whether your insurance companies or your big employers or your governments or your healthcare providers, like you're seeing, you know, the stresses materialize, you know, in a way that is, um, uh, you know, uh, translating into lost human potential, loss of lives, you know, incredible amounts of, you know, spending that could be, you know, um, avoided by, you know, um, proactive, you know, uh, approaches to, you know, sort of food, all of that, I think is, you know, is an incredibly difficult thing to watch, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, every day, you know, I was here in New York in April, you know, and May, and we were having seven to 800 people dying a day, you know, here. And, you know, um, you know, obviously, there are, there were many things, you know, um, you know, sort of contributing to that, but it is clear that when the data is fully, you know, analyzed, this is going to be a story, you know, about um, food, diet, obesity, chronic disease, nutrient deficiencies, you know, it's going to be a story about that and how that burden has fallen on the shoulders of minority communities, you know, um, because of the economic, you know, uh, realities of, you know, food and sustenance and, um, and cheap calories and, you know, um, it was heartbreaking, you know, to watch. You could almost, every time you saw a picture of somebody who died during that time in New York, you could almost visualize them, you know, on the screen. You know, it was much more likely, you know, that they were going to be combating, you know, these chronic, you know, sort of, uh, you know, uh, you know, health diseases that have been around for, you know, for decades and the result of diets. And so unless we, as a community in the world, start making changes there and creating incentives for, you know, scaling up of better, you know, nutritious and efficacious, you know, um, you know, approach to science, you know, towards food, you know, what, what are you putting in your body? What is it doing? you know, how is it benefiting you? The food industry has just gotten away with way too much for way too, you know, long on marketing slogans and pseudoscience and, you know, and, and the like. And so, you know, I think now we're 
ushering in the golden era of a, a new approach to nutrition. And I think the benefits for that are going to be clear. I totally see that as well. And I see that new decade being ushered in and that we really need to get back to, to the health and, and fix, fix our, our, not only our biome, but the biome of a human body, which is really lacking nutrients and, and uh, the good gut health and, and the, the vitamins, minerals out of our food sources, the way that they're being produced and, wh and wh what options we have there. Um, really start with the, the, the first big question for you is, do you feel like you're a global citizen and how would you feel or could you imagine a world without nations, borders, divisions of humanity one from another? And what are your thoughts and feelings about that? Well, first of all, you know, you know, I think as we were talking about right before, you know, we did this, you know, interview, we're, we're, we're in the midst of a, you know, um, you know, a uh, political environment here that obviously is very US centric, but has implications for, you know, sort of the rest of the world. Um, you know, I'm more singularly focused on how to get through the next three months here you know, and, you know, um, finding, um, you know, the, you know, the belief that, you know, our systems, you know, here will hold, hold up under, you know, kind of the pressure that they're under now. And that from there, you know, uh, you know, the U.S. joins, you know, a aligned group of, you know, global um, you know, uh, you know, states that are trying to truly tackle the, you know, the, you know, the issues of this world around sustainability, around you know, food and nutrition, around, you know, all of the things that, you know, I know you're a big believer in. So I'm starting, you know, I'm answering that question from the ground up and not, you know, from the bottom up and not from the, you know, top down. I got to see you know, what grassroots activism on a local level here has done and changed potentially the course, you know, of, you know, sort of this country. So right now I'm in the view that these, you know, very localized grassroots, very, you know, um, you know, sort of progressive uh, strategies, you know, are super important. And then, you know, if we can get through that, then maybe zoom back out for those, you know, sort of those bigger top down, you know, uh, you know, questions. And maybe you mean it as a ground up, you know, you know, bottom up, you know, sort of, yeah. uh, you know, sort of strategy. But right now, all I'm thinking about is what's going on out in that on the on those yeah, streets. Crazy. Because you know, the next couple months there's gonna be a lot more of it. Yeah, it's I mean, I'm I really need to congratulate yeah, the you know, US for their uh, their vote for Biden and whatever controversies and and um, craziness comes out of that for the next month. I don't wish on, upon anybody. I hope that we can move forward with you know the Paris Agreement and and many other things to kind of heal, repair, and, and get into a better place. You know, like the, the World Economic Forum says is, you know, this should be a time of a great reset and awakening that the microscope has been. We've seen the problems and things have bubbled to the surface that we know where the, the systems are broken, what's wrong and how uh, uh, and where they are. Let's get them fixed. Let's, let's have a reset and not go back to, um, you know, back to usual or to uh, normal, that let's, let's truly make it happen and move forward. Because really this year started out in January as a very positive movement in a lot of directions, a lot of uh, movements. And even, even though uh, it's been very tumultuous during the year with the pandemic, good and bad all around the world, um, there's also been some positive things around food and progress that have been made that uh, uh, really take us forward. Now, we still need to have this roadmap of global food reform and have this 
as you so eloquently say it through the foodshot.org and through your uh, food shop um, business and project that we, we need a moonshot, a food shot for better food for the future. We need to start moving in that direction. The reason I, you know, I caveated it with this global citizens and how would you feel about a world without nations and borders is because what we saw through this zoom in and zoom out of the pandemic is really food didn't have any nations or borders. It continued to move around the world uh, uh, during the pandemic and the lockdown. Also, um, and, and a lot of communities bubbled up to, to jump, come to service and to feed people and to make sure that, uh, that it was distributed. Uh, where we saw where the problems in, in our systems were as well. Um, but also that, you know, during, during this time, we had the, uh, uh, the documentary Kiss the Ground come out, which I think is a good, beautiful, regenerative movement and some directions that we need to go that people, you know, wear a seat. But also the, the just last or two weeks ago, the vote on uh, plant-based meats and the, uh, in Europe and the vote on um, yeah. plant-based milks and stuff and, and what, what's happening there and kind of, you know, are, are, are we... Are we going to allow politics to to govern our food when we know that it's just as corrupt as as others? That there's so many um, uh, monies going from private organizations and that uh, in, in the wrong dish uh, direction on on policies around yeah. food and things like that. So I mean, the way I would sort of you know talk about that is like. You know, and I used to come to Europe, you know, to, you know, do talks, you know, and the like and be on panels, you know, European, you know, investment panels, you know, and entrepreneurship panels are very different than sort of, you know, sort of US and, you know, invariably, you know, you'd be on an investment and um, uh, entrepreneur, you know, panel in Europe and you, you know, if you had you know, 45 minute panel, you'd spend 35 minutes talking about regulatory environments. And, um, you know, which is just completely the opposite, you know, you know, kind of the US. I mean, you would never even have, probably have a regulatory conversation, you know, uh, about investment and entrepreneurship, unless it was some incredibly novel you know, technology or, you know, um, you know, uh, you know, sort of process. Uh, that's just, you know, the way, you know, sort of Europe looks at, you know, um, protective industries and, you know, um, but also oversight, you know, around things that Europeans care, you know, uh, you know, deeply about. The thing that I'm starting to think more about on the US side is, you know, we have a structural problem, you know, you know, here, you know, this sort of, you know, kind of cold civil war is what I call it, you know, you know, like there's the Cold War, you know, like we're having a cold civil war. And, yeah. you know, obviously, we hope that the it stays cold, and it does not go, you know, sort of, you know, hot. Um, you know, but there are two nations, you know, here that have stopped hearing each other, you know, and in very few, uh, apart from very few, uh, you know, intersection points, you know, you know, think and act in discreetly. And, you know, obviously that, you know, house divided cannot, you know, stand. And I think we're, you know, I think we're right there. The role of, you um, you know, sort of capital and, you know, sort of entrepreneurship, I think is really about, you know, and if Biden, and even if Trump had stayed, you know, stays in power, but, you know, whoever is in power, you know, has to start believing that at the end of the day, what people want are good jobs, hope for the future, food on the table, all of the social issues, yes, they can get, you know, pretty hot on the periphery, but at the end of the day, you know, education for their kids. I mean, you know, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a relatively simple list of things that, 
you know, have to be, you know, to deliver to have a healthy, you know, sort of society. And, you know, we've probably for too long, you know, um, you know, incentivize the system for, you know, around have and have nots. And, you know, capital is only flowing, you know, into certain, you know, sort of, you know, sort of communities, you know, entrepreneurship and, you know, um, is, you know, a coastal, you know, thing. And what I think food allows in agriculture is a way for, you know, at least here, you know, the entire country to participate, you know, in a reimagining of that and to be beneficiaries of it. So, you know, if you're an entrepreneur in Utah or you're, you know, in West Virginia, or, you know, um, if you start thinking about food from, you know, how are we going to create a 21st century farm? How are we going to start, you know, um, creating decentralized um, controlled environment, you know, sort of, you know, growing um, for, you know, um, you know, cities? How are we going to, you know, create um, uh, regenerative, you know, agriculture that gives, you know, um, you know, farmers premiums on their, you know, uh, you know, on their goods? And, you know, there's, there's a lot of things the entire country could be doing there and capital could be supporting that. And, you know, uh, uh, like um, Steve Case has been doing this work for, you know, a long time. He gets on a bus, you know, he goes across America, you know, he goes, you know, it's called Rise of the Rest, yeah, right? Yeah. You know, it's investments into, you know, these quote flyover, you know, you know, areas and how do we get entrepreneur hubs, you know, going there, you know, how do we, you know, create, you know, opportunity, you know, in which capitals, you know, playing a role. Um, the writer you probably know is now, I'm blanking on it, who um, wrote Hillbilly, you know, Elegy, you know, Elegy, um, you know, that gave the first real insights as to why Trump got elected in 2016. Yeah. He's got a venture fund now. You know, and, and it's basically taking that philosophy and saying, how do we, you know, how do we catalyze, you know, all of these, you know, you know, sort of communities that had not had those ecosystems and not had that capital and not had the, you know, kind of the, um, the roadmap, you know, to be able to be an entrepreneur or to build a company or to, you know, th that's exciting if we can, you know, if we can really do that. And so, you know, I'm hopeful. How, how um, can we, can we dive a little bit more into food shot and you kind of uh, sure. tell me how, how that's evolved, how it's been going and what the, what your main push and drive is, uh, what you want to deploy and see reached with food shot. Sure. So, I mean, you know, food shot got incubated, um, you know, when I was building S2G and the idea was originally that, you know, venture capital is an incredibly powerful tool in, you know, change, but it's not the only tool and it certainly shouldn't be the only voice. And so how do we create a multi-stakeholder platform that brings other voices, you know, into, you know, the mix, you know, representing, you know, uh, industry, you know, finance, um, investment, you know, innovation, nonprofit work. Um, and for us to collectively then on an annual basis say, here's where we want to focus. And then to use uh, a blended capital, so not only you know, um, equity investment, but debt and, you know, um, uh, non-dilutive grant dollars to catalyze, you know, high risk, high reward, high impact, you know, entrepreneurs and scientific work. Um, and to use the consortium of stakeholders to help de-risk that a bit. So, okay, if you're gonna swing for the fences, you know, and take on that higher risk, higher award, maybe by having this group of collaborative stakeholders that have, 
you know, um, their foothold in a lot of the industry, you can help, you know, minimize that, you know, mediate that risk. So that was the kind of the original, you know, sort of concept. Um, we've built that now into 25 different, you know, partners, um, you know, uh, Rabobank, uh, Generation Investment Management, Mars, Grantham, you know, Nature well, Conservancy, you know, a long list of, you know, Rockefeller uh, Foundation, Rockefeller Gen Dutch Generation, Dutch. as Al Gore, by the way, is one, one of his. So, yeah, it was a fabulous yeah. lineup. Um, and so, you know, what we do now, and I think what's exciting for me uh, in the work that I'm doing there now is how do we take big global challenges like soil, you know, sort of protein and create new frameworks that would help investors and entrepreneurs, you know, um, make uh, better decisions in the development of their, um, you know, their companies and their funds, but also that ultimately plays a a way to think about that future food system and how do we get that and define it faster. So on protein, for instance, you know, this was, you know, the approach that we wanted to take here was not about, hey, let's find the next cool alt protein, you know, next beyond meat. You know, there's plenty of people doing that and, you know, that's being done kind of everywhere. I was really convinced that nutrition is this is the key driver for investment and opportunity and entrepreneurship going you know uh, forward so how do we think about protein from a nutritional standpoint on a global basis and what occurred to me as i was thinking about it was that you know we use an incredible amount of resources you know energy you know water um uh you know uh, industrial capacities, um, you know, to create this sort of protein as if it was a shorthand for human health. And it, it's, it, it's not human health is much more, um, you know, much more uh, broad um, micronutrients, phytonutrients, you know, they're all yeah, of these. Yeah. And so like, we're super, fixated on protein as a catch-all and it's not. So the idea was how do we, if we are gonna, you know, um, try to create a better protein system, which obviously because of the resources that it takes and, you know, how focused the consumer public, you know, is on it. Um, how do we steer it in a better, you know, direction and how do we think about it? Um, that's a new framework. And the framework ultimately was that uh, and we, you know, we basically called a precision protein, which was if you're going to spend that much, that many resources on it, it's going to be that much of a fixture for, you know, nutrition. How do we get more precise as to what protein is? What are those amino acids? What do they do? You know, you know, you know, since you can get them from plant proteins and you get them from animal proteins. How do you look at it more from an amino acid perspective and make sure that, you know, you're producing amino acids in a way that is more um, conducive to, to uh, human health. So for instance, the protein needs of an infant versus a child versus a, uh, you know, teenager versus an adult versus, you know, a, a senior citizen are completely different. So why aren't we now starting to think about individuals, you know, um, life stage, gender, you know, um, health history, and really think about their protein access, you know, from, you know, from, from that you know, vantage point. And then if we're going to if we're going to produce proteins, how do we produce them? So, you know, a lot of protein nutrients are lost through the production process. So now you're, you're spending all of these resources to create the protein, but now you're losing a large percentage of it as it moves through the processing. Okay, can we stop doing that? Can we make that more efficient? Can we make, you know, sort of the protein yield on the processing side? more, you know, um, make it better. So we're looking at those kind of things and have put together now, a, you know, a framework 
we're in the final stages of uh, diligence on the pipeline of very exciting companies that span, you know, um, animal meat production, uh, aquaculture, um, fermentation, you know, driven, you know, uh, you know, protein, um, you know, uh, waste to value systems, you know, really exciting stuff. So we'll be announcing those winners on both the Groundbreaker Prize and the Groundbreaker Equity uh, Award in January of 2021. Beautiful, beautiful. Um, maybe you can tease us. I, I know you want to um, start a new fund pretty soon. Um, can you maybe give us a little teaser of what we can look for or is it too soon? No, no, I, I would love to talk about it. Thanks for, uh, thanks for uh, asking. So, um, the new funds called New Epic Capital. Um, you know, uh, the inspiration for it was I started to see in other sectors and other verticals a lot of the signals that I saw in 2012 and 2013 in food and agriculture. And that ultimately, the consumer drivers were all very similar. It was about um, health and wellness. It was about um, efficacy. What is it doing for me? It was about personalization. It was about um, resilience and sustainability. It was about um, uh, e-com and, you know, new, you know, sort of new distributions so the consumers spoken as to basically what, you know, what we want. The systems have to catch up, you know, to that. Now, food and agriculture now has been on a good run to better align, you know, the food system to those consumer drivers. Um, so New Epic will be investing absolutely in food in, in agriculture, but there are these other sectors, you know, um, beauty cosmetics, um, uh, sustainable apparel, um, home and office. Now that we're now spending 90% of our time in our homes, you know, which I think is gonna, a lot of that's gonna continue as well. Now, how do you create, you know, um, uh, better environments, you know, that you're now living and working uh, in. So detoxification of, you know, um, you know, materials and, you know, sort of paints and things like that, you know, microbiome, you know, uh, in your, you know, in your built environments, you know, there's it. lots of science, you know, into, you know, into that. So new Epic will be looking at these you know, these same themes, but now making systems investing, you know, you know, in these other consumer uh, uh, touch points. Sounds like a very systems approach. And it's, you know, the, the resilience scene or the sustainable scene and, you know, no, not no more longer the, the Anthropocene, but this new epoch of something moving more towards either resilience or sustainability, you know, uh, I love it. Uh, perfect. Well, you actually sort of got to why I named it New Epic Capital. Most people haven't sort of picked up, you know, on that, but this is the first epic in which it's being named for man's footprint and thumbprint on the planet. And so, you know, before this, before Anthropocene, it was about species change and geological change. That's not what this is about. This is about for the first time, you know, man is having an effect, you know, on the planet. And so, you know, uh, a fund that sort of understands that, you know, as its core tenant is, you know, really the direction we're going. Beautiful. Uh, yeah, I'm fully aligned. So. Yeah, that's great. I'm excited to to see and hear more, and and, and uh, we the world needs more of this. We just we just that's the direction we need to go. And and I, I, I'm it's crazy why we're so late. Why we haven't jumped on board sooner and and gotten there sooner. There there are some positive movements as well. I mean, this year was supposed to be the launch of the Sustainable uh, Food Summit, the United Nations uh, uh, Food System Summit. Um, it's been pushed till next year now. This year they've had some virtual events and things, but 
it's really bringing food into the discussion and global food reform into the, the international global dialogue, especially at the United Nations, where it's kind of out of backseat. It's been more about renewables and uh, capturing carbon, carbon offsetting, and putting a price on carbon. And really, um, those are all great. They're in the top 10 list, but, to, but we're getting it wrong because the number one way to impact and change is to usher in a better epoch is to start having food in our in our dialogue and, and what can we do to reform it and, and to get to a better place. So I wanna ask you the burning question, WTF, and that's really what we've probably all been pulling out our hair and saying during this pandemic, and especially during the election uh, of the United States. But it's not the square word, it's really the word, you know, what's the future? I, I, I don't really wanna know what your vision of the politics or other nations are, I want to know what's, what's your future. I mean, you've given me a little bit of the setup of, of the, the epoch and, and some of the projects you're working on, but your vision is much bigger on global food reform. So really, what's the future? Where do we need to go? And, and do you have a clear vision of that? Can you describe it to us? I mean, I think I've touched on, you know, it a, a, a little bit here is, you know, I think nutrition is going to be the organizing principle for the food system. And prior to this, for the last, you know, sort of hundred years as the kind of the legacy system was being developed, it was all about calories and securing calories. I think now it really is securing, you know, sort of nutrition. Now that has profound, you know, implications on how you, um, how you transition to that, you know, kind of system. You have to start thinking about things much differently. Okay, farming practices, inputs, you know, um, uh, data. Um, uh, you know, you know. Right now, we think about yield from a, you know, from a idea of bushels per, you know, sort of acre. Well, why wouldn't we start thinking about it in terms of nutritional? you know, outputs as opposed to, you know, sort of yield and, you know, um, you know, unit, you know, sort of, you know, outputs. So, you know, my sense is, again, you know, we're relatively simple beings, you know, uh, you know, we need nourishment, you know, that nourishment feeds, you know, not only, you know, our human health, but our, you know, our spirit, you know, so to speak. So like everybody has a vested interest, you know, in accessing, uh, you know, nutrition. Right now, that system is broken, clearly. You know, it is moving more into a have and have nots, you know, um, you know, sort of structure. That's not sustainable. You know, when you start getting into food and water security, you know, you know, issues, that's when civilizations, you know, come to an end. That's when wars, you know, you know, sort of break out. So everybody's got a vested interest in, you know, accessible nutrition that is global and uh, within planetary boundaries. And so that's, you know, that's the frame. Now the question is, you know, how do you do that? And how do you create the new models that are going to uh, accomplish that? And there's the bottom up part that we talked about, in which you know, um, you know venture capital and entrepreneurs and you know um, you know local you know sort of and regional food um, uh, you know thought leaders are playing this role. And then there's this there's this top down, you know, which is about, you know, big companies, um, you know, insurance, you know, companies, large employers, governments who are also interested in that, you know, outcome. And I think becoming more interested, you know, in that output, you know, in that outcome. And so I see the, the bottom up efforts and the top down, you know, efforts putting pressure on creating 
that, you know, that system, like a diamond, you know, like, you know, from, you know, kind of pressure that makes mm-hmm. a diamond. Yeah. I think that's coming from the bottom and from the top. And so, you know, I think the hope is that that's what gets us, you know, um, there. I think the signals are pretty good. I think COVID accelerated that pressure. Um, and so, um, you know, hopefully we'll get there faster. I really do too. I mean, do you feel that the, this current model that we're on, you know, the civil civilization framework, even the model that you're on in, in Manhattan there, um, as far as food goes, is is that one a model that can be pushed out into the future, or you do? do you know, do you think that that's one of doom and gloom, and that's why we need to have this, you know, global food reform or this bigger vision of how we we fix it? I mean, I mean, do you mean like, you know, is there a model here that's happening now on a local level that you think is replicable or you know, sort of scalable, and maybe give a clue as to what's coming next? Is well, that what you mean? Well, what I mean is, I is it because, you know, as you said in the beginning of our conversation, things bubbling to the surface that we're seeing that there's more food deserts or that the current model we're in, the you know, with uh, extreme lobbyists and extreme uh, monopolies of food and the way the food has been done in the past is just one that's not sustainable. And so you say, well, here's the situation I'm in now, and I'm going to push that model out into the future. What does that look and feel like? Well, it doesn't look or feel very good. And and um, now how do we make the shift? And you, you know, that's where you're talking about this bottom up, which is meeting this top down that does a, it's not working for us, it's creating this new this yeah. new vision or diamond. And that's kind of what I just wanted to maybe push a little bit more of your thoughts yeah. and drill, drill deeper. So one of the things I'm starting to develop with some um, partners um, uh, for, uh, you know, with food shot is, you know, whether, you know, at the end of the day, it's, you need a viable economic model. And so, you know, better food at this point is just more expensive. I don't think that's a radical thing, you know, to say, and that it being more expensive is not just because it can be and there's more you know sort of you know sort of dollars for the entrepreneurs and you know investors because they can charge more that that's that's not where the expense is coming from the expense is coming from it's more expensive because the systems that you need to create better food and do it the right way are just more expensive to do. They're more labor, you know, they take, uh, they have less yield. You know, there's there's all these contributing factors. So all of the venture capital that's come into the innovation front is an attempt to solve some of those scaling issues so that better food over time can be less, you know, sort of, you know, expensive, but it can't be as, you know, it can't be par to, you know, um, you know, a system that's cranking out cheap calories that's been optimized for a hundred years. I mean, that's, you know, you, there's, there's going to be, you know, a gap between even where the most efficient progress is being made to get the costs down of food, um, of good food, there's still going to be a gap to what the cheapest calorie, you know, like uh, food that's contributing to all of these underlying, you know, conditions and, you know, all of these, uh, you know, sort of health impact. So question is, how do you manage that gap? Is And is there incentives in that area so that you can make, you know, the good food cost on par, you know, to to the consumer? to make healthy choices, is there a role for stakeholders, state governments who are concerned, you know, around, you know, um, their, you know, rising, you know, healthcare costs for their, you know, safety net you know, citizens, for employers who are concerned about, you know, reduced productivity, 
you know, for their, you know, workforces, for, you know, food manufacturing companies that are, you know, um, losing market share, um, for entrepreneurial companies that want to gain more, you know, market share, for retailers who want the halo of, you know, sort of health and wellness to be able to differentiate from their competition and to, you know, create loyalty, you know, within and programs within, you know, their stores for health insurance companies who, you know, are going to basically take on the brunt of, you know, all of these, you know, chronic disease, you know, sort of, you know, what I call, um, you know, sort of, uh, you know, the sustainability world talks about externalities. The nutrition world world should be talking about internalities. So I call them internalities. So like, how do you start factoring in those, you know, those costs of the cheap calories going in, but the expense of healthcare, you know, sort of coming out of that system. So, you know, the question, you know, is could there be a consortium of stakeholders that believe that the costs differential between the cheap calorie products and the you know the scaling better for you product that it's it's better to subsidize that delta in the short term to to avoid that much larger delta and all of those internalities you know 10 years 15 years 20 years you know sort of later so we're putting together the broad strokes of a pilot that we would do um, you know, most likely in, um, on the West Coast to, um, to test that thesis with stakeholders in each one of those buckets, insurance company, retailer, big food, government. I did see um, that you have a nice chart on, on your website and I'll put those in the show links so that they can find those as well. I think that's awesome. important. You know, it's interesting and I don't want to maybe dive in just a little bit deeper as well, because I think it's, um, <clears throat> when we were in Madrid, we kind of talked about this or tickled the surface of some of this conversation as well, that <clears throat> in 2008, the entire world's investments pretty much uh, uh, because of the financial crisis and, and some of the things were happening in the markets at that time, stiff to uh, investments in anything to do with food systems uh, because it was a safe bet. It's something that's grown 99 billion or trillions every year nonstop since, since 2008. And uh, it, it not only was a safe bet, but what happened is a real critical thing happened at that time. It turned food into a commodity. So not only did we kind of have the problem even before where those who were producing food weren't always knowledgeable about how to produce food and they were just trying to do it as cheap as, as possible. Well, now that we turned it into a commodity, it's even more so that, that it's not really, the, it's about when we make a profit, can, can, you know, uh, how, how do we do it? And, and it turned it out and, and Carolyn Steele uh, really said it best. She says, if we cheapen food, we basically cheapen life, you know, and, and uh, where you turn, the, food into a commodity where it's not the true value or the total environmental yeah. cost of food or the uh, percentage of EBITDA to produce that food. Um, but then we drilled down even deeper and said, mm -hmm. you know, what if we use a real crazy model, which in my opinion is not that crazy. It has to also tie with this moonshot thinking that for our earth shots and for uh, these, these planet shots. And that is really with moonshot thinking, you're thinking, how can I survive, eat, drink, sleep, get air, oxygen, energy in space in the harshest conditions, be resilient and not while I'm trying to grow food or, or go to the bathroom in space that I'm creating waste or creating inefficiencies or using chemicals or processes in the way I do produce my energy that it kills me in hours because I'm in this confined outer, you know, harsh conditions of outer space. Um, and, and what if we apply those and how we produce food and we discussed that, you know, it's not about the brands or the, the 
the, the food products of the future that really are the key to solving the problem. It's what you've touched upon several times during our whole conversation. It's really about how we produce food it is the biggest impact, not only on environment, human health, human suffering, and, and, and bring, you know, getting more nutrition that will have the biggest impact in the brands of the future. It's how we produce those brands yeah, of the future. Exactly. And, 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 and that's what goes to what you're saying. How can we fill that gap? How can we bring that imbalance back into alignment? So you've got this cheap product that, that is uh, cheap, but there's also no nutrients, minerals, vitamins. There's nothing. You're just, you, you might as well eat dirt or you know maybe dirt would even be better for you. But how do we bring the prices in alignment and still have nutritional, healthy food yeah. that, that doesn't hurt human health or our environment. And the thought process was, why don't we use renewable energy, non-finite resources, battery backup, passive systems, circular economy thinking, cradle to cradle processes where we have this organic cycles, these technical cycles that, that when we produce, we by using these renewables, by using these efficiencies of non-finite resources, we actually reduce our costs of goods sold. We bring in the efficiencies of all the waste of what, what normally occurs in an outdated, antiquated production processes. And then we're not paying the high overheads for land and energy and, yep. and the resources to make that, which brings that cost of goods down and brings our price in comparison to the others. And so uh, I really think that, I mean, uh, what, what you discussed, that's how I hear. That's how, that's how I, uh, I, I think that, you know, the direction uh, of getting us into this global food reform and thinking, getting away from cheapening food and getting it just so that it can still be the true cost, the fair trade, the fair value. Yeah. And I don't know if there's um, anything that you want to jump into that or how you're. So, yeah, your so a, a, a great example that I think would illustrate that on a, a, a number of fronts. Um, so interestingly, so in 2009, I think that would have been, I founded, you know, this sort of investment um, platform with uh, NASA, State Department, USAID, Nike, a bunch of other, you know, corporations called Launch. Um, and the idea for Launch was that, you know, NASA really felt that, you know, they should really be in the sustainability conversation because for decades, you know, they, you know, they were probably best in class at closed loop systems, you know, they had the eyes and the ears, you know, kind of, the, you know, sort of the planet, you know, they were very much an innovation, you know, sort of culture. So when Obama, you know, came in, NASA wanted to position itself, you know, as a you know, kind of a cutting edge thinker on sort of the sustainability. And it wasn't just the Department of Energy that should be yeah. kind of in that you know, sort of conversation. So we founded Launch to be able to, you know, kind of, uh, you know, identify those kind of, you know, sort of companies and to move money, you know, kind of in them and, you know, use this consortium of partners to do that. One of the companies, one of the first companies at this, this time was called Caverdi, uh, who was founded by this woman, Lisa Dyson, um, who was, you know, um, uh, Scientist uh, had uh, you know um, you know spent time at NASA, and she had you know uh, discovered a technology that you know NASA was kind of working on at that point. You know that basically took my you know sort of microbial communities, and you know um, you could uh, take CO two and create different outputs using you know, those sort of communities and uh, specifically hydrogenotropes, which I had never heard that term until I talked to Lisa. Um, so I had met Lisa in 2009 and, you know, we'd kind of worked through launch. Then I had really crossed paths with her until about two years ago when all of a sudden she was now, Coverti, you know, had 
was around and been funded and was doing a lot of that CO2 to value work um, that she was getting into kind of the food industry on um, this sort of protein, you know, and that she had found this application for using these kind of hydrogenotropes, using CO2 as a feedstock, fermentation, uh, I think using oxygen, you know, and hydrogen as well, you know, um, on the inputs and creating a, you know, sort of a protein powder and, you know, kind of doing uh, next beyond meat or you know, kind of impossible using that, you know, sort of, uh, you know, process. Um, so that NASA thinking had led to Coverti and then, you know, clean tech kind of went its way and she was looking at you know the kind of the food industry and was like oh my god like there's this great application for that why don't we you know spin out this company and which is now called air protein and so um uh, i'm on the board of that you know sort of company now but it, it just just shows you you know how do you do meat production you know basically decoupled from agriculture and it's not a cell based you know, uh, yeah. approach, which has a lot of complexity, you know, to and a lot of money going into it. But I think the jury's still out, you know, kind of, you know, on that here, she can use this process, not only in, you know, this really works into my precision protein frame, not only to create, you know, um, you know, uh, distinct amino acid profiles, but then also to create you know, um, other mit micronutrients that can basically be done a, through the same process. So a complete approach to nutritional development decoupled from land, available for renewable, you know, energy, you know, on top of right now, it's, you know, obviously, uh, you know, still reliant on, uh, on uh, non-renewable energy, but you'll be able to get to the renewable yeah. side of it, you know, relatively quickly. Um, so that's a very exciting, you know, sort of company and really well, thinks about these closed loose systems, precision, you know, sort of protein, you know, um, uh, decoupled from, you know, traditional agriculture and scalable, you know, um, you know, with uh, the needs for a global population. So I'm very excited about that one. There's a great company in Helsinki, Finland called Solar Foods. They do yes, a similar so thing as well. Thing, yeah. It's very, very similar to that. Yeah. Um, and, um, you know, as, uh, there are so many cross-cutting uh, thoughts and this, this connecting of complexity science and systems thinking to, to some of these companies. So you mentioned cellular agriculture and there are some really interesting things emerging in that area. Uh, there's still a lot of uh, dealing with the scaffolding, so they can they can yeah. produce, you know, lab grown meat, but it's pretty it's uh, it's almost like an Asian soup uh, thin cut meat that you would get it, you know, it's it's not a true burger in, in in short amount of time, and so they need to work on scaffolding and what's the yeah. what's the inputs and the mediums for those things, and um, but there are some pretty good scaffolding yeah. opportunities around, um, you know, fungus around mushrooms and 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 uh, uh, things there, as well as other plant uh, proteins or other plant-based uh, scaffolding. So there, uh, we're really at the cusp of this new epoch. Is so I can't, you know, I just love how that's so fitting um, to to go into this new direction where we're we have the opportunity. To be creative and inventive and uh, engineer and, and design these food futures, and, and more so, it's a what we've all what we've also touched upon, which I hope my listeners will will pull out of uh, of our discussion, is that it's, we're not really talking about the future of foods. We always keep coming back to how do we get those futures of foods to production and scale, and in this new you know. To the masses, because there could there could be one hundred thousand uh, uh, solar foods or uh, um, um, impossible meats or impossible foods out there, and then we would start to tickle the surface of the problem and and have that impact. And and that I mean goes back to an even other thing, you know, neoliberalism, neo Darwinism, you know, this 
only the strong survive, survival of the fittest, natural selection. Well, that's all bullshit. It's about competition, collab collaboration, and really unifying and realizing, you know, there's almost 8 billion people on this planet and, and impossible foods or solar foods, they're not gonna cover it all. We need to, to be yeah. shifting the way we think about food. And so uh, I, I really could go on and talk to you for hours and hours about things. And I, I, I loved our, our discussions and I hope you will uh, still contribute uh, a section in my book, Menu B. I would love to do that. Of yeah, course. Pe people on planet food saving solutions. I've I've got a spot for you, and I want to hear your wisdom and 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 your thinking and what you've been specializing in for years. But as we wrap up our conversation, uh, I want to give my listeners three sustainable takeaways from you. So something kind of. Uh, uh, selfish, uh, I, I, I want you to give them something that will better their lives. And so I have three questions um, uh, for you to kind of move in that direction. Um, and, and it goes like this, is basically, if there was one message that you could depart to my listeners, uh, a sustainable takeaway that has the power to change their life, what would it be your message? What do you, what do you, uh, before I answer that, maybe you can, you know, kind of give me a little more context for that one. Really, I just, you know, what, if there was, if there was something that you could say, you know, um, here's the future, here's something that really is a message, you know, the message that you preach, I think I, I, I could tell you what I think I've heard out of our conversation, but is there, a message that you could give our listeners that would have the power to change their life or to change their way of thinking, acting, or impacting or on their own world, or, or you know, maybe what's what's your message? Well, I guess I'll answer. You know, I, I guess I'd answer it two ways. One, you know, if you are ever thinking about being you know, an entrepreneur or an investor in this space, now's the time, get off the sidelines and, you know, um, both for, uh, you know, not only the impact side, but the ability to build world-class companies with, you know, with, uh, um, you know, impact and growth now, my God, what an amazing time to reshape the world. So you have a role to play if that is something that, you know, is, you know, uh, 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 of interest. And even if not, the role that we play as consumers voting with our wallets is intensely profound. And if we can move more and more money towards values-based um, uh, um, you know, uh, consumerism, uh, conscious consumerism, uh, I think it's moving there anyway. I mean, I think ultimately more and more people are buying that way. You know, does this brand or does this company, you know, align to my you know, view of my own personal values and those are being expressed through, you know, sort of those companies. The more we're doing that and we're not, you know, sort of sleepwalking, you know, with our, you know, power, you know, as, you know, consumers, the faster, you know, I think the change, you know, uh, is so I think ultimately it's a message of the personal power your, your viewers have um, to reshape that, world and hopefully a better, you know, uh, you know, image. Um, so uh, that would be my response, I think. That, that's beautiful. And I, I really like that because really, if you're, uh, if you invest in, in this, this arena, this area, and, and it's, it's the biggest in the world, it's biggest industries in the world and it affects us, it's our basic needs. Um, it's a good investment, but it's also a solid investment in, in, in your future and one of a desirable future. And pretty much 
most other investments, especially fossil fuels and, and, and others are actually, you're betting against yourself. You're investing against your, your long-term future good outcome. And so um, that's how I see it. I'm a little biased. So uh, the next question is, is what should young innovators in your field um, be looking for or thinking about to make real impact on our world? Well, I mean, in food and in the food and ag yeah. sort of, yeah. So, you know, I think there are, you know, similar to my prior, you know, my prior statement, like, you know, this is the Cambrian explosion of food companies. Like we're, we're, we're there now. And so, um, you know, that's incredible from an opportunity standpoint. Um, I think in reality, you know, the bigger the swing, you know, like, you know, if you're going to do something now, you know, uh, that is going to be a venture backed company, there is no downside to big swings. I mean, you know, this, this is the, you know, sort of the time for that. So um, if you're an entrepreneur, think big and think about, you know, your idea, whatever that is. And is there a, you know, sort of a bigger frame for, you know, where that idea, you know, are you thinking too small? I think would yeah. be the, you know, sort of the first question. Great. The counterpart to that is that at the same time, companies are under, you know, startup companies are going to become more and more under pressure to perform uh, in terms of real businesses, um, you know, more quickly. And that this isn't just um, about big swings. You have to be able to take the swing, but they also need to be running the bases. I don't know if that's a good sports metaphor, but yeah. <laughs> you, you need to, you actually need to, you know, get in there and make your business work. And um, the, you know, the runway for that is a viability is getting shorter and more intense. So like if you're going to build a company, bring a team together, that you know is simultaneously thinking about technology, market development, but somebody in there who's got a really good sense of finance and margins and you know business models and the like, because you know um, that stuff's coming to bear much faster than it did when I started. You know, so you know, in 2014, you know, when I did the Beyond Meat investment, you know, Beyond Meats, you know, if you looked at that from a you know, P and L standpoint, you would ask yourself, why would you ever, yeah. you know, as an investor, invest into that company? You know, could a Beyond Meat now be funded with the same, you know, sort of, uh, you know, um, like runway where it'd be given that much time to, you know, sort of develop viability? I don't know the answer to that. My sense is that runway is shortening. So as you create these companies, make sure that the teams, you know, really bring that multidisciplinary approach, you know, science, market, and um, finance. Thank you. And the, the last question I have for my listeners is really, what have you experienced or learned in, in, in this long 20 plus years professional journey that you would have loved to know from the start and if I only knew that, I mean, well, life would be different. Uh, is there an aha or a moment like that, something that you would say, what a, I would have loved to know this from the start? Well, I've been thinking about that question for a while now, and it sort of also relates back to kind of the Beyond Meat, you know, investment. 
you know, if I'm being completely honest with myself, with myself, you know, the success of that company as an investment, you know, for, you know, um, for the fund really ultimately came from, yes, you know, kind of an understanding of sort of macro trends and things like that. Yes. Is there a role for flexitarian, you know, diets, you know, that are um, for American families to eat less meat, but not become vegan. Right. Okay. That was kind of the macro, but you know, it was a pretty naive investment. Right. So what I think about now is if I took all my learnings from now and went back to that moment, would I have done the investment? Maybe not. And so there is a, you know, there is a role for the art as opposed to the science in this and about, you know, kind of, um, you know, a belief in sort of gut you know, feels, you know, at, at certain points, you know, so the, I think the learning is that your gut does play a role that actually can be quantified, you know, at a, you know, at a, at a certain, you know, point. Um, so, yeah, you know, I think that would be the main thing is like, you know, the aha that I'm having right now is that, you know, knowledge doesn't always play to your, you know, uh, you know, advantage. There is a role for sort of gut and the sort of macro, you know, sort of understanding of where, you know, sort of things are, you know, are going. Um, so I think my, you know, I think the biggest lesson, you know, or the, you know, um, I guess the aha is, um, you know, for a, for an investor anyway, you know, there are, you know, there, the future isn't ultimately seeable, you know, and, you know, some of the way that you have to think about things is to break it down into, you know, um, you know, a set of frameworks that can help you make better decisions, you know, in real time, you know, as they're, you know, they're happening. And a lot of that has to do with the team around you. You know, I had the benefit of, you know, um, you know great partners, you know, smart people. Um, you know, we used to have a phrase that, you know, if, you know, if we were the smartest people in the room, we were in the wrong room. And so, you know, there's a humility, you know, that I, I think, you know, in investments really, you know, important, um, you know, just try to get the smartest people, you know, around you and, um, you know, try to come up with the right balance between art and science, you know, intellect and gut and, um, you know, stay true to your mission and, um, and, you know, try to get as much noise out of your decision making, you know, don't be tempted by like all the shiny, you know, objects and opportunities and where the herd is going, whatever stick to your principles, you know, yes, your, you know, your thesis can evolve over time, but at any one moment, you know, look at it as, um, you know, a, you know, uh, a tool to help you separate the things that you should be, you know, focused on and the ones that, you know, you, you, you shouldn't. So um, I don't think I answered that question. No, I, th I think you did. And you, you actually went beyond. So I, I loved it. And the, the one thing that I took out of it that I want, I want to touch upon. So I love how you say, you know, use your gut as well. Um, if you were to look, looking back, you say, you know, would I made that same decision now, you know, and, and that was kind of the question you, you said, probably not, but that gut is, um, we could go to another rabbit hole, but we won't, we'll, we'll leave it at that. But what I wanted to, to touch upon 
because you said you made that gut decision or that was that gut. But what we're learning today through health, through nutrition, is that our gut is our second brain in some respects. If we have a healthy biome, a good gut health, then, then that true saying, uh, you know, a gut decision can have a lot of meaning and have a lot of, uh, of depth in, in that. But when you're numb and you're under malnutritioned or undernourished, um, sometimes you're numb or desensitized to just common sense decisions in our world because you can't see or feel the world because you're not aligned, you're not healthy. And so maybe that's also something that changes over time or maybe is, is a different type of a gut decision. Um, Thank you so much, Victor, for, for answering those questions and give my listeners these sustainable takeaways that will, they will hopefully apply and go and research and look at your websites and, and see uh, how they can follow in your wise footsteps to move forward. Um, before I say goodbye, I want to ask you if you have any questions for me or if there's anything that we didn't get a touch upon that you'd like to tell my listeners or that you'd like to talk about before I tell you goodbye. Well, my only question would be is like, you know, next time I see you, you know, will that map have all of the lines of the different nation states gone? And will I see a map of just sort of land and, and not of countries? Well, and I, and I have an answer. So uh, today I've, I've recorded a couple podcasts and, and the podcast that I recorded right before you was, was with Parag uh, Kahana, and he uh, is a GIS uh, specialist, PhD, and he does a lot of maps. And um, his, he, uh, I asked him a question about global citizens and that this map is showing borders to divisions and separations of humanity. But if we look at some of the food maps, the cartography food maps out there, if we look at some of the the infrastructure and industry or supply chain maps of our world. If yeah. you look at the population maps of our world, um, you would get a much different view of our world and, wh and what it's like. And I'm actually, for our book, which you'll see, I've got a real unique idea for the cover of the book that has to do with cartography and food. And so you might see a different map behind me you know, the, these white flags and these different, those are some of the projects that I have around the world with the UN World Food Program and uh, FAO and, and other businesses and things that all really almost all of them have to tie with food uh, one way or the other. And so I'm, I'm hoping to show you a different map Good. next time. Well, I look forward to that. Thank you so much. I appreciate I, it, Victor. I, I, it was a so pleasure much. to have you. Did, did, was there anything else you wanted to tell my listeners or did we cover it all? Have we covered a lot, you know, but, uh, yeah, I really enjoyed it. And uh, um, yeah, I hope, uh, I hope your listeners like it. I look forward to reading the, you know, any of the comments that uh, come Perfect. across. It. So. Perfect. I'll put all your links and, and stuff in the show description and and, and I really appreciate it. You have a wonderful day there in New York and, and we'll talk friend. to you soon.